Views expressed by Camaplan podcast guests may not reflect those of Camaplan. Camaplan does not guarantee the accuracy of information provided by guests, nor does it endorse or recommend any individual or organization. Camaplan is not an investment advisor, CPA, realtor, or attorney. You are encouraged to conduct your own due diligence before making investment choices. For any tax, legal, accounting, investment, or other questions, please consult a specialist. Welcome back to The Road to Financial Freedom, where experts share stories and secrets to unlocking financial independence. This podcast is brought to you by Camaplan, a self-directed IRA administrator focused on educating investors on how to grow retirement savings faster through alternative investments. I'm Ricky Chong, Camaplan team member and podcast host. In each episode, we're going to take an in-depth look at the many roads taken to financial freedom and how they differ for each of our guests. Today's guest is Eric Smolinski. He's a 15-year derivative trader, marine vet, and investor. He came from a single family household. His mother worked two jobs to support him and his brother, yet Eric became a millionaire before he was 30. Now let's hear more about his journey and it's going to come directly from the source as I welcome Eric Smolinski. Hey, Eric, how are you today? I'm doing awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Stoked to be here. I am excited to have you here. You have some really cool things that I've honestly, we just talked about it, but I've never heard of and I would love for mm-hmm. you to go into that. So let's just jump right into it. Tell me a little bit about your background and how what it was like growing up in a single family household and becoming a millionaire by 30. I'd love to hear your story. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Um, so let, I think the reason why I like to share that aspect of my story is because there are literally so many people that start like that. A lot of my friends were from single parent households. A lot of my friends you know, went to school and had their lunches subsidized because we couldn't afford it. If I didn't have cafeteria ladies that were just literally angels, there were days that I wouldn't have eaten or they made sure that I had enough to eat because I didn't have the money and they knew it. So, you know, it's just growing up like that led me down a very specific initial trajectory in life. And I was beyond fortunate. One of the most beautiful things about being raised by a single mother, and to be very clear, I did have a dad. I knew him. He had his faults, but I still loved him. I don't like making it sound like he's, you know, awful. He's he he died a few years ago, but I just don't like, you know, coming off that way. So I like to clarify that. But anyways, with having the single mom, I was super, super receptive to information because I knew the way that our life was at that point in time. It didn't appeal to me. I didn't want to live the rest of my life like that because my mom essentially just grinded. That was it. And I I honestly don't know how she did it. I really don't know how she did it. She put herself in the very back seat to make sure that my brother and I had a launch pad for the rest of our lives. And seeing the way that she did it, she did it the only way she knew how, which is to work her butt off. And as much as I saw that and I respected that, I would also see other kids in school that clearly had much better finance situations than I did. And that really motivated me to try to figure out a way out of it. The big thing was the information gap. I didn't know where to go. I didn't know what to, where to look. So all I started to do is what I saw. And I started to work all sorts of jobs. I was selling Christmas trees, splitting wood, bringing people's garbage cans in, delivering groceries. Whatever I could do to make a few dollars, I started doing because that's what I saw. And I ended up meeting one of the most transformative mentors of my life. I refer to him as my stepdad because he and I have just gotten that close. That's essentially the role he's filled in my life. And he asked me when I was in um, ninth grade, he said, you know, have you thought about investing? Because he saw how much I was working. He didn't really know what I was doing with my money. He said, have you thought about investing? And I said, I sure haven't because I have no idea what that is. And he gave me like a quick overview. And then he said, you should look these few things up, go to the library. And I did. And I started a brokerage account via uh, through my mother. 
And that's essentially how I got started uh, investing super early based on the information somebody shared with me. So because of small tidbits that somebody willingly shared with me, my life path completely changed. The trajectory completely changed. I have a naturally obsessive personality. So as soon as I started getting somewhat interested in investing, that's when it started going you know, knee deep, then over my head real fast to try to learn as fast as I possibly could. And the big motivation was I wanted to change the outlook of my life. I wanted to live a different lifestyle and also to be you know, sure that I was in a place to help support my mother because she worked uh, contract jobs. So she didn't have a 401k. She doesn't have this big retirement set aside for her. She's worked real hard, but she doesn't have those finances in place. So I knew that I would have to have something put together for her. So big motivation, at least to, to get me down the right path. And then a couple dots were connected and you know, off to the races I went. Wow, that's that's an inspirational story. I mean, you really started at a young age. It's almost mm -hmm. um, mirroring Robert Kiyosaki's experience. I don't know if you ever read the book Rich Dad Poor Dad, but he I had. Haven't. It's definitely worth a read. It's a quick read. It's he had an alternative parent, kind of similar to you, where it was a best friend's dad, and he introduced him to the lifestyle of learning how to make your money work for you at a young age. And he kind of did something similar instead of sending him to a library, the, he took him to work the two children to work and kind of put them into the work lifestyle at a very, very young age. Like I'm saying like oh, awesome. elementary. Yeah. Gave them the experience of you can do this your whole life or you can fast track it and do this. And it showed them um, the same kind of thing. So I feel like the trajectory you put yourself on was incredible because of this this gentleman you call your stepdad. Mm -hmm. And you were really lucky to have that in your life. But also You're you welcome. had a really great examples. I mean, your mother, she showed how much she loved you by wanting to make sure your life was you know, okay for you and your brother by grinding, as you put it. So I, I think that's amazing that you really did have those wonderful people, you know, to look up to and that were in your life to do that. And I, I mean, I think I read that you even are, were able to help your mom retire once you hit, became a millionaire. Like you didn't want her to struggle or have to be in that grind anymore. Is that right? Yeah. So my mom, she's an occupational therapist. She works with essentially, you know, different kids with varying mental disabilities. And she's done that for a really long time. So when I started getting into a position where I could affect the lifestyle she had, I essentially just had a conversation with her and I said, Hey, like we, we have choices. So, you know, I do think it's important for people to maintain a certain level of activity, just because, especially as you get older, my grandpa worked until he was in his 80s. And that's just because, you know, that's how he was bred. But more importantly, I, I think that there's a, a positive just mental output to that, to knowing, you know, you're still contributing. So essentially, you know, it came to the point where we set up a plan for my mom where work became optional for her. So she essentially started figuring out what she wanted to do, how much she wanted to work. And that that was just one of the most Im important things for me to make sure was in place for her so that she didn't have to feel like she had to continue this grind into perpetuity. That's amazing. And I think that's the goal for a lot of people these days is that, you know, your family took care of you while you were growing up. Now it's your turn to take care of them. Like, I mm -hmm. think the beginning of the season we had, I don't know if you know her, but Isabel Gorino Smith, who is the COO of the Residential Assisted Living Academy. So she focuses on, you know, making sure people that are getting into that elderly stage have a comfortable place to live and, you know, be cared for in residential assisted living instead of, you know, going into what she calls a big box facility, like right. where they're just treated like patients. So I think a lot of people that have the mindset of entrepreneurship or, you know, wealth, it's also like family oriented. So I love that. I think that's amazing. And you have so many other backgrounds and you said you took, you had so many jobs. So what is it about investing that really, you know, really caught your mind that made you, I, I believe you said that you became like obsessed with it. So mm -hmm. what is it about that, that really made you obsessed? I think that's an interest. Yeah, I think there was a couple things. I think the very first one is the accessibility. So before I got into real estate, 
you know, I, I always had my eye on real estate, but you, you need money to start. Even if you have great leverage available to you, even if you have um, good finances in order, you, you still need capital to start and you can't escape it. Whereas with investing, you, you need essentially nothing. You can open a brokerage account with zero dollars and then you can start using, I used it as a foothold. And as I started getting more actively interested in the space, that's when I started realizing like, wait a minute, you know, it's, there's not just buy and hold. I can actively move in and out of things. Oh, okay, cool. And I started doing that and noticing that I was able to do okay. And I started just becoming exposed to different styles of investing or different investment vehicles. And it allowed me to play with timeframes, with leverage, so that I could essentially accelerate my timeframes. That's what I wanted. One of the things that my stepdad referred to me or like imparted to me early on was, you know, money now is better than money later. Even if money later might be better or more money, it's not always better. And I say that because, you know, obviously there's something to be said about delayed gratification. There's a balance to be struck in anything regarding life or finance. But if you gave me the choice between $1 million today or $5 million in 10 years, I'm taking the 1 million today because I can turn it to over five in five years. That's not really a huge hurdle. So I wanted to figure out ways to accelerate my time frame, And part of it was because of that guidance. Part of it is because like most young men, I was about as impatient as you could possibly get. And I just <laughs> wanted to be rich right now. And, you know, I was, I was missing the point in a lot of ways, but that eagerness served me well because it really forced me to just obsess over this stuff. I was just looking, I kind of keep a really big uh, plan. It's called my trading plan, or I call it my wealth development strategies. And it's essentially like a word doc with everything that I think about all of my different investing strategies, all the stuff like that. And I mean, over the last 15 years of trading, I've, I've easily put in over 20,000 hours into this space. And it is because of that obsession. It's because I wanted to figure out how to make this happen faster so that I can enjoy the fruits of my labor faster. And so that my mom, you know, she's not getting any younger. So the last thing I wanted it is for me to have to wait until I'm 50 to figure it out. And then at that point, she's already, you know, on the back nine, so to speak. And I would rather her still have some time and like flexibility. Go, go on a cruise, go do whatever old people want to do, but go do it. <laughs> so that, you know, it's not just this drab existence into, you know, when we're so old, we're not super mobile anymore and, you know, things like that. So yeah. investing offered me an incredible space. It works really well with the way that my mind works. And the low, essentially zero overhead served me really well. And then as soon as I had assets to move into other asset classes, I immediately started to do that because there's other opportunities, tax advantages, all other sorts of things uh, that come into the broader equation. Yeah. And we don't say obsession as it's a bad thing. I mean, anything can be an obsession and it's great. So yeah, don't take it negatively. That's to our viewers and things like that. If you're obsessed with something and you're, you want to make that, you know, your ultimate goal, go for it, reach for your goals. And that sounds like exactly what you did. You really immersed yourself in the finance, you know, world investing. So you had touched on real estate investing. What other types of investing do you do or do you enjoy, or maybe that you don't do anymore because you've learned a lesson? I'd love to hear about that. Yeah. So in terms of like my primary active investments right now, it would be obviously trading in the markets. Real estate is still up there and angel investing. Those, those are kind of like the three big ones for me. And then the things that I don't do anymore, primarily Forex, foreign exchange investing. There's good leverage, but those are very difficult markets for me personally. I know a few people who are very successful there. Not a good fit for me. And then other really get rich quick stuff. So like penny stocks, I avoid like the plague and then like binary options, not big into those. So, you know, I've moved away from, 
I moved away from things that are appealing to the uninitiated. But then once you start to learn, just like any casino games, if you're a gambler or poker hands, if you play poker, there's probabilities associated with all of this that all lead into this most wonderful formula called expectancy or expected return. And we can use that to make just educated decisions about how we choose to make money and where to weight our efforts and finances. Interesting. Interesting. So I love that you really went through the process a little bit of what made you change your mind when you got used to something. Cause I feel like a lot of people they're they're nervous to try things. You know, they'll they'll stick to stocks because they know it or because Jim Cramer or someone talks about it, you know, and and they trust that person. But I like that you dealt, you know, you delved into it yourself and you learned, okay, I like this. I'm not really a fan of this, or especially with the foreign markets. I mean, you learn that it just wasn't your niche. So like you don't do it anymore. And I completely commend that. I am interested. I know that you do something called derivative trading. Is that is that mm-hmm. correct? Can you yeah. tell me about that or tell me a little bit about what it is? And I'd also love to learn about angel investing. So let's do that a little later. Sure. <laughs> so to keep it high level, to start off, what I've learned so far in finance is the fi- finance space in general wants to... Especially big finance... They want nothing more than to separate a person from their money because that's when they get to insert themselves and make some of it. There are really awesome things out there that actually try to connect investors closer to their money by giving them access to things. But the reason why I say that is even down to this terminology of derivatives, options, and futures, and you know the whole line of lingo that goes with it, it's just made to sound confusing. So if some of this sounds confusing, it literally is just a terminology gap. It's nothing more than that because I am not the brightest bulb in the box. And if I can sit down and figure this stuff out genuinely, anybody can, but you just have to accept the fact that there is this initial hurdle. So with that little caveat aside, <laughs> de- derivatives in short are products whose values are derived, derivatives derived from something else. So what I like to use is the analogy of real estate, specifically like a house and a deed, like I was kind of telling you before we started recording. But Mm -hmm. when we think about the derivatives world, there are a ton of kinds of derivatives. It's really not just options and futures. Most retail traders immediately think options or futures. But if you saw the big short with Michael Burry, He created a derivative like big banks. Well, there's a lot of other forms of derivatives. They're just a little more complex than what most retail traders have typical access to, which are options and futures. So when I think about, I typically trade options. I do trade futures as well. And there's slightly different rules between them, but they bubble up to the same concept, which is an option is essentially like the deed to a house. Whereas if you have a house, that is the asset. The house, the physical structure, the land that it's on, that is the real asset. However, the deed, whoever owns that deed technically has the right to that asset. So it's what connects that person to the asset. It's kind of similar with derivatives. So if I'm trading options contracts, I'm essentially trading a piece of paper that gives me access or some sort of obligation regarding a specific asset. And I know it sounds kind of, you know, just esoteric because it it really kind of is. It's all fairy dust. It's all just, you know, stuff on a screen. But realistically, it's a different way to play the stock market. So most people are used to being able to buy or sell different securities. So securities being equities or bonds, you know, ETFs, ETNs, stocks, things like that. And most of those products will have options tied to them that you can trade if they're more liquid products, highly traded things. And then futures are kind of this other space. I I don't think it makes a ton of sense to dive too far into that. I imagine most people are probably like at this point already, what are you talking about, dude? (laughs) Um, But yeah, they're essentially just a different way to trade the market. 
Interesting. And I know you had mentioned earlier angel investing. Now that's a first we're talking about it. I was actually talking to my manager about it before we got on this because I did see, you know, that you delve into that a little bit. So could you give a high level of that information for, you know, maybe new listeners or listeners that never heard of it like me? Yeah, for sure. So angel investing is another like just fascinating space because essentially when a business is growing, Sooner or later, a lot of times they will need financing, whether it's to buy a new building, whether it's to hire people to help them expand or to get a production line started for a specific product, so on and so forth. Sometimes they'll go to a big bank and the big bank will have a very strict process that they have to go through. The terms are not always super favorable to the person who's seeking financing. So angel investing is an alternative approach for them to get financing or even to get help with the business. So sometimes angel investing is just essentially lending money to a company that might not want to go through traditional methods via a bank. They might not be able to get super great rates. They might not even qualify for some sort of business loan. It could be that a company is looking for some financing, but also wants to tap into your resource pool as an angel investor. So if there's a person who is trying to grow a brand, they might want some money, but they also might need some help growing a brand. No problem. I know people who can help them grow a brand and just put those two in touch with one another. And that's kind of part of the the service. So angel investing is really a super fun way to interact with up and coming businesses. There's a ton of ways to get involved. You can do it via structured syndicates that exist. It's essentially, you know, crowdsource angel investing. You could be a standalone angel investor, which is my typical preference, or via a partnership with other individual angel investors and, you know, pool resources to help a business out. So it's a way to help businesses that are early on in their journey grow. And there's also pretty good rewards tied to it because, again, depending on the terms, you can structure things that's like very mutually beneficial. We can come to an agreement that's better for the business, that's better for me than just going into like a CD or something like that. And you know, you can move on. Now, the one thing I will say about angel investing is that it is super risky. It is very, very risky because if a business just goes insolvent because it's not working out, there's a good chance you will see zero dollars back. So you have to, you know, understand the relationship between risk and reward as it pertains to angel investing. But in short, it's a way to, you know, support businesses as they're growing. So that brings me to my next question, I guess. When someone comes to you with the idea of you being an angel investor, mm-hmm. what kind of attributes to their business do you look for that makes you inclined to invest in them? Is there something specific? Do you stick to a niche? Let me know a little bit about that. Yeah, definitely. I, I've actually become very discerning. So I avoid certain industries in their entirety. And most of it is because I don't know much about them. And more importantly, I don't want to know much about them because I'm just not interested. So for me, like if somebody comes to me with like a fashion brand, I literally don't care. And that's not to, you know, squash their idea. That's, you know, fine. Do, do a fashion brand. They're very successful. But for me, I, couldn't care less about fashion, the fashion industry. It's just not for me. So I kind of stick to areas that I enjoy learning about or already have some sort of existing knowledge in. And most of that is so that I could at least have a conversation about it. So like right now, I'm investing in a couple different things. One of them is a platform for retail traders. Essentially, it's kind of like a... I wouldn't call it a Bloomberg terminal. It's definitely not to that level of information packed in, but it's like a retail trader version of a Bloomberg terminal. And the idea is it's a way for retail traders to get information, connect with other retail traders, things like that. So, and obviously that's very close to what I do. So I was super happy to help invest in that. I'm actually creating, you know, educational content for them as well. And it's just because like, again, that's kind of the cool part about angel investing is there's all different kinds of agreements you can strike with people. So if it's something in the finance space, I'm pretty close with that. Also general technology, pretty close with that. The other thing that is really, really important to me though, is when I sit down to have a conversation with somebody about a business, I am not as adventurous as I once was, unless it's just a really, really cool idea that I just think would be so fun to work on. 
I'm typically looking for something that at least has some semblance of a proof of concept or a proof of concept is not that far away for us to be able to test. Because what I have learned is angel investing takes a ton of time, a ton of time. And if I think about the return on my time, it's probably the worst between investing in the markets and real estate. I just like it. It's fun for me. I don't have like this scale that shark tanks do, you know, so it's where it's, you know, just add one to the bucket and have an entire staff essentially assist them. So for me to get involved, it is a ton of time. So I'm I'm pretty selective about this stuff that I'll I'll enter into, but really even that's translated over to trading and investing. I've just become far more discerning. I, I'm not as interested in trying to interact as much as humanly possible. I'm looking to kind of take very, very specific shots on things that I think are higher probability to work out in my favor with good expectancy. And I deploy those kind of uh, strategies. Well, that's smart. I mean, I mean, you hit millionaire when you were 30. Are you still close to 30? I mean, is this the reason? I'm- no, I'm 31 now. But oh. yeah. Oh, wow. It was just very recent. Well, that's awesome. Yeah, that's really the, awesome. <laughs> the funny thing about that too is like I never I hate those kind of taglines. Like they're really it's I would rather not have to say something like that, but I do know that people it gives people some sort of quantifiable metric to understand, you know, like what is possible. And it was actually my wife who's the one that like said, "Why don't you ever say this in anything?" And I was like, I don't like to, but she's like, <laughs> no, man, like imagine if you were on the other side, wouldn't you want to know, you know, like what's, and I was like, yeah, it's true. So yeah, it's, it is, I, it was probably uh 28 or 29 when I crossed my first million. That's, that's liquid. That wasn't really including a bunch of real estate and stuff. So yeah, it's, it's possible to really create significant returns if you take a very calculated approach, I would say. Yeah, definitely. And I think the point I was trying to get at was that you understand how to make money for yourself at this point. Mm. You understand what works for you and what doesn't. And that's the reason why you're more selective with things instead of just diving into all these different things that you might not see the return on because you already can tell that you're not going to see the return on it. Because especially like you had mentioned the fashion industry, we'll go back to that, for example, you don't know anything about it. What are you going to bring to the company that's really going to help them succeed? So I totally understand. I mean, I'm not saying, you know, stay more, you know, conservative with your funds or anything, but you're taking the risks that make sense to you. Definitely. Exactly. And and the way that I frame all of it is for me, especially it, it all comes back to the stock market because I've been doing this for 14 full years, 15 now, you know, partial years. And I have a known good. Like I know what I can do in the stock market. Over the last 14 full years, my compound annual growth rate is just over 22%. So 22% per year, essentially. And like I'm very comfortable with that return. It's nothing crazy like some of the US investing championship dudes who are doing like literally 300% in a year, which is awesome. But for me, I wanted I wanted to strike a balance. You know, I wasn't trying to go for broke and get rich by 22. I was comfortable with some level of delayed gratification, but I didn't want it to have to wait until I was 60. So for me, it all comes back to that benchmark. Is there a good enough reason For me to take this money from a known good on what I can do in the stock market and put it into real estate or put it into angel investing. Sometimes it will come down to real estate being a good opportunity or a good tax shelter or some flavor of that. It's not always it has to be a gross outperforming return. Sometimes there's other qualities that go into the calculation for angel investing. Like I was saying before, it could just be does this look really freaking cool? And do I want to spend time learning about it? So yeah, sometimes that means I'll take 50,000 out of the account, 100,000, put it in whatever that business is. So I get to learn about it and help them along their path. So it definitely is always a constant thought process of like, is there a good reason for me to move this out of what I know I can do by myself, no external factors into something with a million external factors? Yeah. And I think what I'm also getting here is that you don't really have a team that works with you, do you? It's it's all just you doing you doing angel investing for these people. So, I mean, you also have to understand, you know, to the audience that 
you know, he's balancing his time. It's the time that he has that he can give appropriately to each of these investments. So I think that's another whole part of the risk factor that, you know, you're really just sticking to what you know, what you understand or what you want to understand. So that's, that's not dumb. That's very smart. Honestly, like there's some people, you know, that just take risk and maybe they shouldn't be because they haven't learned about that aspect of what they're diving into. So I think it's great. You did all the research, you, you're self-taught for the most part part. You just had that push when you were younger to become self-taught. And I commend you for that. That's awesome. What about, okay, so you had mentioned a little bit of investing in real estate. Is there a certain type of real estate that you enjoy more than others, like, you know, residential or commercial, or is it just buying, you know, mortgages or notes or something like that? It's typically property. So I actually just sold one of my rental properties this year. I think that came in at like 260K net profit. And real estate, I'm in San Diego. So I am not relocated to my immediate geographic region. But I also acknowledge the fact that real estate here behaves differently than a lot of the country. And it has been really to my benefit. I do like residential, but obviously there are just a whole list of potential problems that go with that. Like for that, the house that I just sold, Right as the renters were moving out, they were like, oh, hey, BT dubs, we see some moisture in the cabinet. And I was like, sick. Maybe the dishwasher was leaking. And I, you know, finally get over to look at the house and I look at the baseboards. They are completely like black with mold. And I was just like, Buckle up, buttercup. This is about to get awful. And essentially, one of the main vertical pipes in the wall had a leak that was going for some undescribed period of time. So long story short, we essentially had to gut the entire kitchen. And, you know, thankfully, insurance helped us with a good bit of it. And funny enough, speaking about the insane housing market here in Southern California, I didn't even put the kitchen back together. I sold it. And I just said, fine, see see y'all later. (laughs) And I mean, it between what we got from the insurance to cover the cost of the prospective repair and what I essentially discounted the house to account for that, we made what we were going to sell the house for anyways. And we just did it faster instead of having to wait, you know, for the kitchen to get repaired. But, you know, that's just like one of the lovely things that goes with having, you know, renters. And fortunately for me, I live right by Camp Pendleton. I am a big advocate of working with military renters, at least, you know, when I can. And it's just because we, there's a relationship there. And I understand a lot of their qualities right out of the gate. But this, and I don't think that they hid anything from me. I just literally don't think that they noticed it. But when they were like emptying, you know, the cabinet out is when they started to notice it. So like with real estate investing, I've just learned that there's a lot of these little tiny pitfalls that can be a big old pain in the butt, depending on how much time you want to, you know, allocate to it. Because I do have a hard time having like a property management company. I do it myself. And it's because again, my stepdad who's pretty big into real estate, has some property management companies. And I have seen nothing but awful things happen. And he ends up managing it himself anyways, because they have to come to him for any cost that's like over $500 or whatever. So he's doing it anyways. The only thing that they do is like line up the person who's going to go fix whatever it is. It's like, I could do that via Google in 14 seconds. So I'll just cut them out of this. But I real estate's been really good to me in that sense, at least. Commercial real estate is super expensive out here, at least in terms of the cap rates, which again goes back to that calculus. Should I take money out of the stock market, knowing what I can do, and put it into six to eight percent cap rate on some sort of commercial property? Obviously, the good part there is stability, and some of them do appreciate meaningfully in value. So I started to gain exposure to commercial via syndicates. So it's a way for me to outsource some of that cost. Whereas the residential places here, it's a different story because if I can find a place for three to five hundred thousand dollars and put some people in it, fine, no big deal. But most of the commercial real estate out here is, you know, at least a million plus. So there's just a completely different calculus that goes in that. So when it comes to real estate, I'm definitely more involved in the like physical side of things, like re- real estate or I'm sorry, um, residential buildings, commercial buildings, not so much just bonds or you know rate swaps or anything like that. 
Well, if you're ever looking for a good syndication, I'm sure Camo Plan can definitely get you involved in one because we sure. we're huge with that here. Um, we do educational webinars and things like that all the time. So yeah, I would love to, I mean, I might even be able to find you a good management company. We have a ton of contacts that have Jeez. things like that. So yeah, I mean, we can talk after the podcast, obviously, but I think what you're doing is really interesting. You have, you're very diverse in your portfolio. You have a lot of different things going for you. What is something that you've learned? Maybe it doesn't have to do with investing. That's really put your life into a specific like trajectory that's kind of helped you along the way to decide that, yeah, I'm not going to, I'm not going to put my risk into that anymore. Was there an aha moment for you that really like set that together? It's a really fascinating question. A couple of things pop into mind. I think the main thing that I've thought about is I actually felt like I was too risk averse for too long. And it wasn't until I started getting more confident in deploying where I was able to make what I would consider to be like meaningful wealth aligned with the time frame that I was looking for. So one of the first things that I thought about was not necessarily going head first into any one thing with everything that I had, but more trying to find different areas that offered varying potential returns. And as I started to create a data set, honing in on those. So prime example in the stock market, when I was learning to trade, I had a buy and hold portfolio that was working. When I started trading, I didn't just trade one strategy. I tried like five to 10 different strategies. And then as I saw which were successful, what worked better, what worked worse, I just started allocating my time and resources to capitalize on where I was seeing success and then scaling into those opportunities. So I think the main thing for me was, I didn't know what I didn't know. I needed to create a data set so that I could understand what the right decision was for me. So I aggressively looked for ways to create that data set. So then I could confidently wait where I'm putting my capital and time so that I can essentially reach the goals. And then the other thing I'll end with there is it was so important for me to maintain like literally laser focus. There are so many things, so many rabbit holes, so many opportunities, so many things you see on Instagram. Everybody on Instagram, apparently they're balling out everybody because <laughs> I don't know where all these rich, incredibly rich people are. I'm trying to find them, but they're all just balling out. And you know, when you're in the grinding phase of trying to build, you look at that and part of it's aspirational. Part of it's like, man, you know, they're 23 and they're on like a 120 foot yacht. It's like, hmm, maybe I need to go faster. But what I started to realize is, you know, not to disparage anybody else's efforts, different people hit different things at different times. As long as I knew and saw that I was making meaningful progress towards my own goals, that always kept me centered. So as soon as I saw that 23-year-old balling out on their yacht, I would think, man, that looks cool. I'm stoked for you. But I need to stick to this because it's working and I'm going to keep moving until this actually happens for me. It was very easy to you know, get distracted out there. Yeah. And I think that goes back to like the whole social media is they want to show you what, you know, what you can aspire to, or, you know, it might not even be real life. Like my thought mm -hmm. is it's a green screen. That's not real. That's a, you know, or all fake <laughs> or they rented yep. it or, you know, they just jumped on someone's boat that wasn't theirs. <laughs> Yep. So, yeah, I mean, definitely you keep on your trajectory, keep doing you honestly, because you're doing it. And I think what you're doing is great. And it's inspirational for all of our listeners, including myself. It makes me want to, you know, learn more about all of this and see if there's a different option that I want to take besides just having my one rental property that I've mentioned here, like probably 20 times already on this show. But yeah, I mean, I think it's awesome. Two last questions for you here. What does financial freedom mean to you? And do you have any advice or inspirational quote that you can share with our audience for them to you know, keep on their path of success? Sure. So the for me, financial freedom really boils down to having the time and resources to do what you want. And I personally think for for me having the flexibility to choose to do what i want 
is extremely powerful. And there's this really weird thing that happened is when I first hit that threshold, like a lot of people, I thought, oh, wow, you know, like I, I, I made it. I can just not do anything and, you know, just exist. How cool is this? I could just essentially be on a perpetual vacation for the rest of my life. And then I, I literally sat there. I was just like, is that what you want to do? Like the rest of your life, you just want to do nothing and just sit there and, you know, be, you know, happy, fat and happy, just do nothing. I was like, what nonsense is that? And it really made me like reconsider what my priorities were as a human being. And I think that we all have a contractual agreement implicitly to do our best to add value to society, to other people's lives, because I don't know one person that got to wherever they were if they were successful solely by themselves. I don't know one. So that's something I think about. And to answer the second question you asked, one of the things I go back to a lot is Roosevelt's quote on the the man in the arena. And I really like that notion. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with the quote. I don't have it memorized. But essentially, it boils down to there are people who will essentially make fun of the man in the arena who's in there trying his best, but failing. But the thing is, is the man is in the arena, not the people who are spectating, watching and commenting on his performance. What makes me really identify with that is our ego is super powerful. We don't like looking stupid. We don't like feeling like we don't know what we're doing. And the only way to figure it out is to be the man or woman in the arena to be okay with looking stupid. I remember the first time that I picked up surfing, I'm six foot, you know, 230. I'm not exactly the typical surfer, you know, physique. And I'm pretty athletic, but it was so difficult. And there's all these kids out there just thrash and they're having a ball. And I'm like, just sitting there trying to stand up. And I'm like, oh man, you know, I was a Marine officer on active duty at the time. I was super physical. And I was just watching all these kids just tear me up. And I was like, I feel so stupid. But I just learned to laugh and enjoy and start to focus on, hey, you know, today I caught two waves before I couldn't catch any. And sure enough, I'm out there having the time of my life, just balling on the waves, doing what I love. And I think focusing more on being okay, looking silly, starting something new, being the newbie is so useful. And I think it's the only true way to learn a skill is to put the old ego in a backseat, be okay being the student, be a perpetual student, but don't be afraid to look stupid because otherwise you're not going to learn anything. You're just going to sit on the sidelines. I think that's a really great way to end this, honestly, because I mean, it's the same thing for me, really. You kind of put everything that I'm feeling into words. Like when I started this podcast, I did not know what I was doing. And as you saw earlier, I tripped over some words. We had to restart this podcast. Like, (laughs) but you know what? Like you just go with the flow and you just keep doing you and you're going to succeed and be successful. So I think, I think that was a great way, you know, great advice and great lessons for everyone no matter what your aspirations are in life, definitely just don't be afraid to put yourself out there and just, just do it. Like as Nike said, because honestly, like just do it now, Eric, where are some places that we can find you? Where can we follow you hear more about the investments and things that you're diving into? Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, for sure. So I'm mostly on Twitter at ES invests and then I'm on YouTube at ES invests. And that's, Pretty much it. I do have a website. I do have a blog. I don't really use them too much. It's really those other two mediums, Twitter and YouTube for me. Okay, awesome. Well, those will be in the links below. And again, I just want to thank you, Eric, so much for being here. I learned a lot today. And I think you brought a lot of information and aspiration to our, you know, our listeners. And I also just want to thank Cama Plan, who's the sponsor of this podcast. Make sure please to follow Eric on YouTube, ES Invest. And also on Twitter, you can keep up to date with him that way. And if you're looking for information about self-directed IRAs, please go to camaplan.com. We can request a console. You can look at our media libraries of webinars and podcasts, and you can also open an account right there. Thank you so much again for listening. Remember to like, follow, and share this podcast, The Road to Financial Freedom, to continue with us on this journey on the path of finding success. Thanks again, Eric. I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you, you guys are rad.